Hello, I'm Seema Kumar. I'm Global Head for Innovation, Global Health and Scientific Engagement at Johnson & Johnson, and I want to welcome you to Champions of Science. During today's live show, we're going to celebrate the role that science plays in making our world a better place and honor those who are using innovation to improve lives. Now, before we get started, I want to briefly congratulate two amazing scientists who Champions of Science have previously honored. Earlier this month, Dr. Jennifer Doudna and Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier, the 2014 winners of the Dr. Paul Janssen Award, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing a method for genome editing. We're proud to know these two extraordinary women and thank them for reminding us about the power of science. This past weekend, individuals and organizations from 150 countries came together to observe World Mental Health Day. Today, we're gonna to celebrate those working to advance mental health solutions and recognize the recipient of the 2020 Dr. Gieselin Breaking the Chains of Stigma Award, an inspiring individual who has devoted himself to demystifying mental illness and providing services to those most in need. I'm here again at the powerhouse, Johnson & Johnson's Historical Museum. Given the continued need for social distancing, today's Champions of Science guests will be joining remotely from all over the world. And please submit any questions or share your thoughts about mental health care in the comments section. We'll try to address some of them at the end of the show. COVID-19 continues to change life as we know it. The disease has taken more than a million lives and many fear that a second wave could force further restrictions on schools and businesses. This crisis has had a sweeping impact on mental health. From fear, anxiety, and stress about a new disease to depression and isolation from social distancing, coping with this new normal has been a big challenge for all of us. In fact, the United States recently said that mental health is a second pandemic-related crisis. And that's why today, more than ever, it's important that we champion the efforts of some of the most amazing individuals and organizations from around the world who are working to end stigma and give hope to those living with mental illness. As part of our ongoing commitment to advance care for patients with mental illness, we partnered with the museum Dr. Gieselin to create the Dr. Gieselin Award. It honors those that are furthering the legacy of Dr. Joseph Gieselin, the first Belgian psychiatrist and pioneer in the treatment of people with mental illness. Throughout his career, Dr. Gieselin paid special attention to the social integration of his patients. The award that now bears his name specifically rewards people and initiatives that approach those suffering from a mental illness as cultural, creative, and social beings. I'm pleased to share that this year, we received nearly 50 nominations for the Gieselin Award from 18 different countries. The 13 shortlisted nominees, who range from art galleries, theater directors, and journalists, to health clinics, scientists, and not-for-profit organizations, all share a passion and dedication to improve mental health care and reduce stigma around the world. Joining me now to talk further about the Dr. Gieselin Award is Dr. Renee Stockman, Chairman of the Museum, Dr. Gieselin. Hi, Dr. Stockman, Brother Stockman. Hello. Thank you nice for joining us. Thank you. Very nice, very nice to see you. Uh, it's been a while since we saw each other. Hope you're doing well yes. and keeping safe. That's okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have such great memories of visiting the Gisland Museum. And when I was there uh, about two years ago, I remember it as being a wonderful place. It was a beautiful fall day, airy outside, but then when you went inside, you saw the exhibits, you know, that were from the old days of how people used to be treated with mental illness. And it was just a juxtaposition of that that I found very interesting. Talk a little bit about the museum, what it showcases, and why it's important. So I became a director in the Gislain Institute in 1980. And I was really impressed myself that I could become director in such a historical place the first psychiatric yeah. hospital in Belgium, and founded by the first psychiatrist, Dr. Gislain. And therefore, I mm -hmm. started to collect some uh, information about the history. And in 1986, 
I started with a small exposition, trying to really bring through the exposition people nearer to what it is to become mentally ill. So I use really, I can say, the, the exposition as a medium to bring people nearer to the reality of mental illness. And step by step we developed and finally it became, as you know, our Dr. Gislein Museum with an, uh, a collection about the history, but then also trying always to cope with uh, elements who are linked with mental health care in the cultural world, social world, and so on, and even with art. That's great. Uh, thank you. And of course, Dr. Gislein was a pioneer because, you know, I think his treatment was based partly on science, but also mm. there was a groundbreaking uh, aspect of his approach. What about his approach was special and what makes it relevant even today? Mm. So we have to go back in the history, and it was in 1815 that the British of Charity started with the care of mentally ill people, and it was really taking out, away the chains. And this change you can always still see in the museum. The British of Charity did it out of charity, but I felt immediately we need professional care also. We like to do our charity in a professional way. And there started the collaboration with Dr. Joseph Gislain, a young medical doctor, mm -hmm. not a psychiatrist because mm -hmm. psychiatry didn't exist, mm -hmm. but he was open, I can say, together with the brothers to look how we can improve the situation of these mm -hmm. patients. And first of all, he saw uh, mental uh, illness, uh, madness as an illness. And that was a very important point. Before they were in prison, they were totally abandoned. They said, no, these people are sick. And so he made a classification and he started also to develop therapy. And what is very special was his moral treatment. And the moral treatment are three elements always present. He said, we must bring the patients in a good environment. And his dream was to create the hospital. And he was a son of an mm -hmm. architect. And so with his yeah. knowledge, he made, I can say, an ideal plan that he could realize himself uh, during his lifetime. And that became the actual Dr. Gislain Hospital. Secondly, the yeah. important, uh, the, the, central part, the central place mm -hmm. we can see caregiver. The medical doctor and the brothers and the nurse and so on are models. And the patients have to, uh, I can say, see these models for their own life. And the third element of the moral treatment was the importance of activities. He saw really the importance of labor and the healing craft, we can say, of uh, activities. And then for him was a very important principle in his treatment, uh, no violence, no change anymore. So that is, I can say, the summary of uh, the, the renewal he brought or something totally new in the field of mental health care. And he can really be seen as the father of mental health care in Belgium. Well, that's just extraordinary to think about that this all happened such a long time ago and it's still mm. relevant. Um, now, stigma, we are talking today about stigma and breaking the chains of stigma. Why is stigma still so pervasive and why is it important to break those chains of stigma? When I look around the world and we have the possibility to do it because we are present as British of Charity in 30 countries worldwide, also in Africa and Asia, there we see uh, that the stigma is, is still very, very high uh, in the field of mental health care. And I think it is all about fear and also, I can say, shame. Uh, nobody is thinking in his life, I can become, an, uh, I can have a mental illness. That is something we are never thinking about it. So we are ignoring that. We, have, we are afraid of it. And also, of course, in with mental health care, you are confronted with aggression and, and, and so on. So all these things are coming together and that gives a very negative stigma on everything about uh, mental illness. And that is what we see, that we have to, to work on it. And uh, therefore, I, I'm so happy with this uh, Gislain uh, Award, because we just focus on people, on persons, on groups, who uh, do something in a very special way to get down the stigma. We did it at the beginning, we can say, in taking away the chains. But today we have to continue to take away the, the change of the, the stigma. I mm -hmm. think that is very important. Thank you. And of course, you've had the privilege of seeing all of the, the, the nominations and uh, ah. you saw the shortlisted list of nominees. And of course, you also are aware of the award winners work. Um, so tell us a little bit about how does their passion 
and their innovation give you hope for the future? Every time that, that we receive uh, the nominees, we can say, and I also come to the, the final choice, I'm always impressed uh, about these people. S several of them I met personally, of course, at the moment of the award, but also had the occasion to go uh, on their place to visit them and, and to see what they are doing in reality. And I'm so impressed, especially by the way that people who have had themselves an experience of mental illness, for example, the one of today, Talk it is to like you. that. Yes. Afterwards, yes. They, they say we can do something. And then you see that one person, and together, of course, forming a group with other persons, can change fundamentally and substantially, I can say, the care, the good care for psychiatric patients and put down that stigma. So every time, every, uh, I can say, award was for me really a an, an happy moment to see people who are enthusiastic and with their dedication, they can change the world. They can change, I can say, the world uh, in which our psychiatric patients are living today. Uh, I was uh, a few times ago in uh, uh, in Nepal, where I visited uh, our friend Mat Matrika, really, I was impressed how that one person in that country, like alone, we can say, is changing the whole mentality. So, uh, and that out again of his own experience that he had. So that is for me really the, the most beautiful point of our award. Uh, of course, sometimes it is also towards people who are more scientific, okay, but when we can find someone who is doing that out of his own experience and then out of it really help other people, that is for me really marvelous. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Stockman. I mean, it's so well said. One person can change the world. One person can start a movement and it can have a multiplier effect. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for joining us from Belgium and thank you, Dr. Stockman. See you. You're welcome. So, Dr. Stockman, as he said, it's important work and it's an honor to be able to collaborate with the museum, Dr. Giesland, to present this award. And now for this year's award recipient. For more than 30 years, Gregoire Ahangbanan has devoted himself to demystifying mental illness and organizing contemporary psychiatric services for people in need across West Africa, a region where mental health has historically been misunderstood. After battling and recovering from his own depression, Gregoire was inspired to help others in West Africa along their mental health journey. Applying many of the same humane principles Dr. Giesland pioneered in Belgium nearly two centuries ago, Gregoire created the Saint-Camille Association to offer individuals in West Africa basic and psychiatric care. What began in 1991 as a single room operation in Ivory Coast has today grown to nearly 50 centers across Ivory Coast, Benin, and Togo. The coupling of a small number of inpatient psychiatric care centers with mobile outpatient clinics has become a prototype for psychiatric services in developing countries. It is estimated that 100,000 people have benefited from their services and have been able to return to their families and communities with dignity and with confidence. With our partners at Janssen, and the Museum da Dr. Giesland, I'm honored to name Gregoire Ahangmanon, the recipient of the 2020 Dr. Giesland Breaking the Chains of Stigma Award for his extraordinary efforts to change the way mental health and mental illness is understood and treated. Gregoire couldn't be with us live today, but here's what he had to say about receiving this very prestigious award. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Grégoire Aron Bonan. Je viens vers vous pour vous exprimer ma joie, ma très grande reconnaissance pour ce prix que vous venez de donner à l'association saint camille le prix du musée du docteur Guilin. Je voulais vous dire un grand merci pour ce prix. Je voulais dire un grand merci à la compagnie Janssen. Je voulais dire un grand merci au comité de sélection qui, pour le neuvième prix du musée du docteur Guilin, a bien voulu choisir l'association Saint-Camille 
pour le combat qu'il essaie de mener pour tous les enchaînés de nos pays d'Afrique. Oui, ça fait 30 ans que nous avons commencé cette lutte. Ça fait 30 ans que nous avons commencé à découvrir l'image qui fait honte à toute l'humanité, des hommes, des femmes, enchaînés à des arbres, sous prétexte qu'ils sont possédés par le diable, parce qu'ils sont simplement mentalement malades. C'est ça qui est notre lutte principale, la lutte pour redonner la dignité à ces personnes, la lutte pour redonner la joie de vivre à ces personnes. C'est ça que nous avons commencé. Et aujourd'hui, cette reconnaissance ne fait que nous redonner la joie de pouvoir continuer ce combat. Parce que je sais aussi que c'est votre combat, le combat de briser ces chaînes. Ici, ce sont des chaînes visibles que nous essayons de couper. En même temps, des chaînes qui ne sont pas visibles. Aujourd'hui, je peux dire que ces malades sont heureux. Heureux pour ce prix que vous venez de leur offrir. Merci à vous tous et que Dieu vous bénisse. Grand merci à vous, Grégoire Hangmanon. Much deserved congratulations. A reminder to those of you who just joined us that we're taking your questions and thoughts in the comments and we'll answer some of them at the end of the show. Now, Gregoire Ahangmanon's courage and determination has clearly helped thousands of West Africans affected by mental illness, giving them a place to seek care and support. But the situation in developing countries remains challenging. More than 80% of the people who have mental disorders live in low and middle income communities, and less than 10% of them have access to treatment. In Rwanda, 20% of the general population is living with mental illness, a figure that rises to 52% among genocide survivors. Thankfully, a new partnership with Rwanda's Ministry of Health is helping to improve mental health conditions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Let's take a look. Mental health is a very unrecognized and undertreated uh, challenge in the world. If you go to many countries, the number of mental health care workers for the population is very, very low. There has never been real investment in education of enough people to take care of mental health. So it's an integrated approach which needs to happen. More training for healthcare workers, more physicians, psychiatrists, neurologists, but also new medicines. In Rwanda, what you are doing is a proof of concept, especially introducing some of the new innovative medicines and technologies. We have been able to train over 60,000 community health workers where community health workers can identify patients in the community and refer them for services and ensure we can make essential medicine and innovative medicine available to the population who needs them. Long-acting injectables have really been a transformational innovation for people living with psychotic symptoms. People who need to take these pills every day of their life for the rest of their life, it's a real challenge. And their disease doesn't help. Our patients, the ones suffering from schizophrenia, used to take their pill on a daily basis. But now uh, with uh, Johnson & Johnson, we have a, an injection uh, for every three months. There is no health without mental health. Let's give mental health the, the same attention as we give to physical health. What I really hope is that stigma in mental health can disappear that we can bring mental health to the forefront of just being a normal disease, like a common cold, that people don't have to be afraid to come forward. So I hope that with promoting 
breaking the stigma, we can achieve that more people can get the best care they need for the best life they want to live. I continue to be amazed and inspired by the impact the simple human gifts of empathy and acceptance can have on those affected by mental illness. I was last in Rwanda two years ago. I saw the devastation and the impact of genocide up close. I'm so proud that Johnson & Johnson has decided to move quickly to initiate this new partnership with the health ministry and even pr prouder to see the impact it's having on Rwanda's overall mental health challenges. We're pleased now to be joined by three very special guests to further explore the ways culture can influence perceptions of mental illness. Dr. Benoit Desroches is a psychiatrist and volunteer at Saint Camille Association, founded in 1994 by Gregoire Ahanbanan, and he is joined by author Siri Hustved, who is a member of the Giesland Jury, and Dr. Husseini Manji, he is the head of a new Johnson & Johnson initiative aiming to address the unmet need surrounding neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us virtually. Nice to see all of you. Pleasure so being here, Sino. Thank you very much. Great, yes. great. Well, my first question goes to you, Benoit. So you've worked very closely with Gregoire and with the San Camille Association. I want you to talk a little bit about the work, but also about the culture of mental health in Africa. What's working and what's still needed? <clears throat> So um, I started to get involved uh, by chance, actually, in uh, 2010. Um, I was supposed to go uh, to court, and it got canceled. And so I just happened to listen to the radio, which I wasn't doing, basically, usually at that time. And there was um, an interview with um, someone named Grégoire Ambonon from Benin. Mm -hmm. And since I was a kid, uh, actually a, a teenager, I, I was interested in going to Africa and, uh, you know, doing missions. Just one of my idols then was uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer from France. And so I had mm -hmm. read about him and all this. And so um, I, I, he, when I listened to the program, they said that he was going to give a talk uh, about 20 minutes from my place. So I went there, I listened to him, and... Um, we got presented, and from then on, it started. I went once a year, about a month, uh, since the last 10 years. And, um, but but my, my first reflex was to observe first. I you know, didn't know much about Africa. I never had been there. And so I thought, well, you know, I started to read on the saint Camille Association. Uh, it started as a small charitable association in, in the 80s, in 1983, but it, it got, uh, and so they were helping abandoned patients in hospitals, uh, lepers, uh, prisoners, and the last of the last, the forgotten of the forgotten, were the mentally ill patients. The problem mm. with the culture is, I think, overall on the planet, um, a lot of... Um, there's a, we all know there's a lot of stigma. It just it has a, a different um, twist to it on different aspects of the globe. But usually there's, uh, there's a lot of fear. And mm -hmm. um, in Africa, it takes um, the color of, uh, you know, they, they think that uh, people have been cast spells on and that they have not uh, done the rituals to the ancestors and to the spirits. And basically, um, people are afraid that, you know, if they get in contact with uh, not only schizophrenic, we're talking about psychiatric illnesses, so mental illnesses here, we, we're talking about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. but we're also talking about epilepsy, which here in our countries, yeah. we treat under neurology. But then, you yeah. know, there in, in Africa, there's not enough neurologists. So yeah. uh, mental, uh, Ill, uh, mental, mental um, health professionals get to treat epilepsy. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's interesting because you know, that kind of culture and the sort of uh, superstitions, if you will, uh, which are centuries old, uh, have we made progress in addressing that and creating awareness uh, that these are actually 
uh, mental health disorders that can be treated? Well, uh, we have to understand how the uh, saint Camille Association works. Basically, in 25 years, from 1994, it, it started to uh, deal with mentally ill patients around 1994. And up to now, in the last 25 years, um, Grégoire, uh, who, was, who is not a, a medical doctor, he's, he was a mechanic, actually. And he, he, uh, under, he underwent a depression and he went back to his Catholic faith and wanted to live the scriptures by the book, if we may say. And he started to want to help people. And, and as I said, the, the forgotten of the forgotten, he wanted to, to, to go and help them. He rapidly understood, in spite of his culture, because he's Beninese, he comes from Benin. And Benin is one of the countries where witchery and, and, and those superstitions are most um, upheld. Um, and so he, he understood rapidly, though, uh, when he started working in, in Ivory Coast, because that's when the saint Ami started, he understood that those were illnesses, were medical problems. And he associated with some psychiatrists then and started to learn how to, uh, how to treat these people. And so over the last 25 years, he's been able to build uh, inpatient centers. There are uh, 10 of them uh, throughout uh, Ivory mm -hmm. Coast and Benin. There's eight rehab centers because once pe once the schizophrenics and bipolar patients are being treated, they have to be rehabbed. This is where, where Saint Camille Association really <clears throat> wants to treat the person, the whole person. And uh, basically, we have ambulatory hospitals in the bo in both countries because mentally ill patients. Uh, they're not being treated in regular hospitals because even medical doctors are afraid that they may get the spell from the patients, if you understand. Mm -hmm. So, um, yep. and there are also dispensaries across the country, 50 of them. So saint Camille has spread this system, which really goes by what the WHO, the World Health Association uh, organization has recommended. So they're throughout Ivory Coast, Benin and Togo. And... Uh, 100,000 people have been helped, uh, patients have been That's brought great. back to life, brought back to their families, brought back to their jobs, or learned some trades. And people have seen that. And uh, the reason why I'm saying all this is that uh, mentalities are changing now, because in Africa, people chain up people to trees in villages. Uh, they chain them up in prayer centers throughout Africa. They uh, also uh, roam about and wander in the cities. But seeing that these people may be, re they, that these uh, uh, mentally ill patients may recover, yeah. So yes. they, they get the proof. So by these actions now, the people in Benin don't chain up their people anymore. They bring them to the centers and they get treated. So we really see that there's a lot of work that has been done a curbing stigma by actions. And this is what Grégoire wanted. That's excellent. That's really, really, really wonderful to see. And no wonder this award is called Breaking the Chains of Stigma Award. So um, Siri, I want to ask you a question. Uh, you and I have met a couple of times before on previous awards, and you have had the privilege to be on this jury. But you've also written a lot of uh, books and you know other articles mm -hmm. about this issue uh, and the issue of stigma. Talk a little bit about, you know, why stigma still exists, you know, after all these years and how can we eliminate it? Well, I think, um, you know, we were just talking about Africa, um, but in the West and in many cultures, uh, spirits, for example, you mentioned or, you know, people being possessed or haunted. Um, I think that the mind body problem has been a big issue, certainly mm -hmm. in the West for how we think about mental illness. It's all in head or, you know, you're, you're crazy. It's uh, thought of as very different from having a heart attack. Um, we know, of course, that there are neurobiological um, changes um, in mental illness, which at least from my point of view, doesn't mean that we can reduce mental illness to particular parts of the brain, say, or particular brain processes. And we can't do that because every illness, not just mental illness, exists in a context. 
right? And that context mm -hmm. is cultural and mm -hmm. um, with other people. We're social animals, we exist in groups and we understand ourselves and others through those group concepts, right? That change yeah. from culture to culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, how do we fight stigma? Stigma is uh, deeply part of individual cultures and it always interacts with other factors. So race, class, gender are also involved in stigma, right? Even, you know, in the United States, we might think of our attitudes about mental illness as truly enlightened. And I think they are more enlightened than some other places in the world. Um, but a black but woman, still... yeah, yeah, a black woman in the United States with, um, let's say, uh, 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 you know, bipolar disorder um, is going to be treated. And there are many studies that show that this is the case in ways that are influenced by the cultures, you know, racism and sexism. Uh, so all of this has to be taken into account. Um, and I think, uh, you know, trying to get over the hurdle of this idea that the mind and body are completely separate, you know, we're embodied subjects. And yeah. um, if we think about that, right, that, that we're complex whole human beings, as was said earlier, um, yep. in relation to other people, in relation to our culture, I think we get a much more subtle understanding of mental illness. Yeah. Thank you, Siri. And Husseini, I mean, we're talking about culture, we're talking about the whole person, and the whole person actually inside of an ecosystem, inside of a, of a culture, right? Yeah. Now you, of course, uh, you're a neuropsychiatrist and uh, as a neuroscientist. So as a scientist, how do you think about perceptions of culture? How do you think about the issue of mental illness and stigma and solutions that you would suggest? Sure, thank you, Seema. So, and I think I'd really echo what um, Benoit and Shiri mentioned. You know, while these illnesses often have a biologic basis, we have to think about them in the context of the whole person in terms of society and um, not sort of just compartmentalize it. You know, I think it just it's important to say at the outset when we're talking about culture, it's not remotely to suggest that one culture is better than the other. You know, diversity and richness of cultures um, enriches us all. But I do think there are some cultural nuances and sometimes these have a bearing on how we treat our fellow man and woman with dignity and care. I think you heard a little bit about, you know, for, for example, in Africa, how some of the concerns about, you know, potential possession and um, so people with schizophrenia have been chained, et cetera, and we need to do everything to raise awareness and even the cultural context, even if, you know, in places of worship, et cetera, help people understand that these are also illnesses that could benefit from treatment and spiritual guidance. Mm -hmm. I think, as you know, in many cultures, um, mental illness or mental health challenges are viewed as um, weaknesses and as something to hide. And as Shiri yeah. said, even in the US, we know that mental health stigma is huge in African-American and Hispanic communities. And people in the US from these minority groups are much less likely to get mental health treatment. And as you know, again, and you know, given the time we're in, this is almost a double whammy because, you know, in many of these minority cultures, you know, as the Black Lives Movement is bringing to the fore, you know, these populations are sometimes marginalized, face economic hardships or incarcerated at high rates. So these stresses really increase the potential for mental ill health. And it's a shame if people, you know, sort of don't get the treatment. It's one of the reasons why I was at the NIH, I actually worked very closely with African-American and Hispanic communities within their places of worship and other places to help raise awareness, reduce stigma. We also launched an um, initiative called Real Men, Real Depression to really show there's nothing about you know, weakness. And I think the last example I might give is in mainly a Asian cultures, there's almost, you know, they almost value, you know, sort of um, conformity to norms and family recognition is, you know, through achievement. So when someone has a mental illness, it's almost viewed as a source of shame for the family. And I think this is very unfortunate as well, because these are cultures that often have high rates of depression. For example, there's tremendous social pressure 
to conform to what some people will call the model minority stereotype, and especially for women to be successful at home and at work. Um, I think just to mention the last thing, um, I do think it's important how, why I think it's so important to use science to help also um, tackle stigma. You know, I think as um, Shiri mentioned, you know, we do need to educate people about the understanding about the biologic basis of mental illness. That's not to say that we're going to be very reductionistic. We're going to put it in the context of the whole person and society, but we need to increase awareness, educate people. And I truly believe like HIV, AIDS or cancer, when they made scientific progress, it helped in stigma too. So the hope is that, and I, I'm really hopeful that, you know, because we're developing transformational treatments, because the younger generation is so much more open about mental health and very, very active on social media to communicate their thoughts, and because of the tremendous work of people like Gregoire, I think there's reasons to be optimistic that we've got a long way to go, but we're seeing some progress. And if we work together, we can make a real difference. Yeah, so let's end on that note. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, just no, go ahead, to, please. Sorry, <laughs> we're talking over each other. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. Finish your thought. I just want to say, in in light of um, you know how external circumstances um, affect people, including in mental illness, uh, there have been some recent studies about uh, gene expression and its relation to racism, for example. Um, and how it plays a role in chronic inflammation. So there's a direct um, connection that people can be educated about. Um, yeah. You know, that these are real effects, they're biological effects, um, but they are triggered epigenetically by what's happening to the person in the culture as a whole. No, that so, absolutely, a, that's so yeah, very well stated. So, Sorry, Seema, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just amplify yeah. what Siri said. You know, that's so real. I, I think we know there are sort of social determinants of health as well. But I think what we've learned is that these social factors, they actually have what we call epigenetic effects. So they turn certain genes on or off. So we, you know, as um, Siri suggested, you can actually demonstrate that some of these stress genes are often markedly turned on through the because of the environmental effects. And that results in, you know, deleterious long term physical and mental health consequences. So it's just a way of helping people understand that uh, absolutely the environment plays a big role, but the environment actually influences your biology to result in problems. And if we can help you and, and helping you is not just about medication, it's about medication, about social support, about therapy and reducing stigma, we can make a real difference. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we have heard your perspective and we're happy to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, clearly a very interesting topic and it turns out that we have actually individuals from 20 different countries now watching us live here on LinkedIn. While many challenges remain, it's heartening to know that we collectively continue to make strides. Whether it's innovative new treatments, research, or community outreach, I'm left feeling very hopeful and inspired by the ever-evolving playbook. As we look to educate new generations and find new ways for messaging to resonate, it's crucial that we continue to look to new tools and solutions. Katie Morton, a California-based clinical psychologist, is doing just that leveraging technology and social media to educate, help push for better services worldwide, and remove the stigma from those getting help. Her outreach has never been more important as she works to help people through this period of increased anxiety amidst the pandemic. I started creating videos on YouTube because no one seemed to be understanding eating disorders. And at the time I was working at an eating disorder treatment center and it just continued to grow from there. We have been creating educational mental health content on YouTube for almost nine years now. Good morning, everybody. So today's video is gonna be a little bit different. I specialize in the treatment of eating disorders and self-injury. I did most of my training in different eating disorder treatment centers, and I found that work to be some of the most rewarding I have ever done. Too often, these disorders are stigmatized and misunderstood. People are hurting and feeling overwhelmed with everything that's happening this year. 
Online, they've been wanting more information about anxiety, managing those worry thoughts, depressive symptoms, and dealing with isolation. Those issues have been more popular now than ever before. Social media has definitely played a role in my ability to reach a younger audience. We have to meet people where they're at. Making important information available to anyone at any time of day is important, and I believe that's why I've been able to reach a younger generation with my videos. Honestly, the best way to normalize it is to talk about it more. The more common it is to hear that someone has seen a therapist or has talked to a psychiatrist, the less stigma there will be attached to people getting that help. Mental health is important to me because it's part of our overall wellness. I've always said healthy mind means a healthy body, and I believe it. Our next guest is Dr. Bill Martin, who has taken on the role of Global Therapeutic Area Head for Neuroscience at the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. Welcome, Bill, and congratulations to you on your new role. Thank you, Seema. Welcome. Great to be here. Good to see you, albeit virtually. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. So first of all, I'm sure you had a chance to see all the submissions and actually read through the work of Gregoire. What strikes you most when you look through these nominations and learn about the work of Gregoire and some of the other nominees? Well, first off, I want to congratulate all the nominees for this year's award for their incredible achievements. Um, we know that no single action will shift the mindset on mental health, which is why we celebrate those who are championing initiatives that can together help shift the culture in communities around the world. This is my first year uh, participating in the Dr. Guislain Award. And um, when I look at the work of this year's winner, Gregoire, I was struck by his courage to turn his personal experience with depression into advocacy. For the nearly 100,000 people who've been uh, impacted by his work, I mean, this is really uh, amazing to me. His work has helped both literally and figuratively um, fulfill the mission of this award by breaking the chains surrounding people living with mental illnesses and bringing modern psychiatric care and medication to West Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, um, but, you know, it turns out that despite all of the successes that we've had in medicine, in sort of supportive care, in advocacy, there continues to be this stigma that continues to bring things down. And, you know, I think, especially in, during this pandemic, this issue of stigma becomes even more important. So why haven't been, we been more successful in addressing it? What's needing? to be done? What's more needing to be done? Well, that's right, Seema. I mean, this has been unquestionably a challenging year for all of us. And I'm so pleased to see that mental health is getting the global recognition that it needs. Um, I've been inspired by how mental health uh, community has, has united uh, during this pandemic, in particular, uh, to help normalize and create an open and honest dialogue uh, about feelings of fear, stress, and anxiety that have impacted us all. To address stigma, I think we need to continue to be open, uh, to tell our stories, to encourage others to tell their stories, and in my opinion, to share the science of mental illness uh, and wellness. Mm -hmm. that's, that's absolutely you know, on point. Now, Bill, you have an announcement to make because, you know, I know that we've done a great job with the Gisland Award, but you want to expand and scale the recognition of people who are doing work in mental health. So tell us about the announcement. Yes, that's right, Seema. You know, um, with so many impactful initiatives uh, to recognize, we wanted to conclude today's ceremony by opening the 2021 call for nominations. And as you heard earlier, this award honors Dr. Uh, Joseph Guislain, the first Belgian psychiatrist to provide scientifically based treatment for these individuals. And in honor of his legacy and in celebration of the award's 10-year anniversary, we're expanding our commitment to the mental health community by adding a second award category to the 2021 Dr. Gislin Breaking the Chains of Stigma uh, Award. This year, the new category, or next year, the new award category will focus specifically on science and technology. If you know an individual, organization, or project 
that is using science and technology or science and technology to improve mental health, I encourage you to nominate them for next year's award. The winner of this category will also receive $50,000 to help further their work, and more information will be available uh, on the awards website um, after today's event. As I mentioned, we see advances in and awareness of science and technology as key components to breaking the stigma of mental illness. We also see this new award category as a powerful way to continue to bring forward uh, Dr. Gisela's legacy into our current uh, century. What a wonderful announcement. And of course, I'm sure that this time next year, we'll be looking at multiple nominations. And for nominations, people should go to the website and hear more about and learn more about how to submit nominations. So thank you, thank you, Bill. So I know throughout the, the, the time we've been getting uh, Q and A's from, some, from social, and I wanted to just, uh, I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, Adam from LinkedIn is asking, something we are hearing a lot, and this is, uh, do you have any advice for others who might want to get involved in helping promote mental health and well-being? What can an individual do to drive advocacy about this issue? Any advice from you? Well, I think this is a really great question and a great way to think about it in the context of today's award with Gregoire taking his own experience and translating that into advocacy. I think that um, everyone wants to know that they're part of something. And so when, when one takes one's own experience and, and seeks to identify ways to tell their story, tell another person's story, reach out, connect, uh, this is actually, I think, the foundations of what one can do in terms of um, advocating for for all of those, uh, some some of whom cannot ag advocate for themselves. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us and a very exciting announcement. Uh, thanks, Bill. See thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So, Thank you for joining today in Champions of Science and recognizing those amongst us who are tirelessly working every day to improve the human condition. There's no better time than the present to put more of our focus on our society's mental health and remove the stigma that is so prevalent in our culture. With a trust in science and a respect for each other, I believe we can. Thank you to all of our guests today and congratulations again to this year's award winner, Gregoire Ahangbanan, who won the 2020 Dr. Gieslan Award. And thanks to all of you for watching. Let's continue to learn, continue to question, continue to champion science. Stay well, be healthy. <laughs>